Good morning, everybody. So on the to-do list for today, one, finish exercising. Two, as part of exercising, I'm going to do the push mowing around my yard because yesterday I just used the riding lawnmower. And then three, I think I have to work on carabiners. There's some other stuff I want to do, but I think if I let myself get distracted, the carabiners will never get done. So focus on carabiners today. I really, really, really want to get my good prototype I just need one good prototype for product photography. One that I'm completely happy with. Then I can figure the rest out during the Kickstarter. But right now, I just need one good prototype so I can do my product photography and then get this Kickstarter launched. I really have no desire to mow. My prayers have been answered. I don't have gas. And this is empty. Grumble, 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 grumble. So I was doing some procrastination and I finally got an idea on how to fix this. In a nutshell, my issue is that the carabiner is not exactly where the mill thinks it is for whatever reason. I don't know if it's because my fixture is bad or if because my fixturine is bending the part or if you know the parts are, are too far off from what they are in CAD, I don't know. But I have this little magical thing called a probe. And if I split this up into a couple different work coordinate systems, I can just probe those individually from each other. And so then that'll adjust for any misalignment that's in you know, my whole setup. So I'm gonna go back into cam. I'm gonna break this up into probably three different work coordinate systems and then probe it all in and see if that fixes my issue. Though actually, before I do that, I want to eliminate another variable first. And that is my work coordinate. Now we tried to do this before with the old design and that was to use some super glue fixturing just to make sure there's no distorting forces on the workpiece but i want to try that again with the new design and the new code to see if it makes a difference and if it is actually that clamp that is distorting our part because i i think it might be still so same code we ran last time this time with super glue work holding I would really rather not use super glue work holding in a production setting, but honestly, if it works, if I had two pallets that I could switch out, it wouldn't be the end of the world, especially because with super glue, it means you don't need fixture clamps, which take up a lot of space on your pallet. So I could get a pretty tight part density. So it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be that bad to take a pallet that had like 20 carabiners on it, you know, put it in a tray of acetone for, 45 minutes as the other pallet's running and then just swap them over offline. Or maybe do it with some sort of vacuum so at least don't have a lot of surface area. I don't know. We'll see if this works. I did use activator, so it should be dry by now. Okay, I gave it five more minutes. Let's hit it. Go! Is it just me or did it not turn on the spindle? I feel like the spindle is supposed to be on for it to cut. Oh, that was close. I stopped it before it hit. That was almost a crash. Why didn't my spindle turn on? Let's go back off a little bit. It did not make contact with the part. I'm glad I was watching. Okay. Um, we did have a power outage when this was on the other day. Can we go forwards? Well, now the spindle's running. What just happened? I mean, the spindle gets turned on right there. Huh? Was it? No, it wasn't trying to restore at a different line. Okay, let's just hit cycle start again and see what happens. Hey, look, a spindle turns on. That's disturbing. That's terrifying. I I don't know what happened. It's working now. I'll just have to keep an eye on it. I sent a message to Tormach about the weird spindle not turning on issue. I am, I'm willing to, to write it off as a weird one-off thing that happened. Last time I was using my machine, it was on 
but not in the middle of a cycle, and we lost power to the whole neighborhood. And so that improper shutdown may have like caused something weird, like there was a flag that was supposed to be tripped in the controller and it didn't get tripped. Um, so it was probably something to do with the improper shutdown because the power turned off and then I was like, okay, I guess I'm done for today. And I just hit the e-stop, walked away and never really, you know, shut it down completely. Um, so that's probably to blame, but I want Tormach to be aware of this just so that, you know, doesn't happen to anybody else, especially if it's, you know, the 30th time you've run the same code and you're trusting it to run the same, then it doesn't. You know, now that I'm looking at this, I, there's not very much room. There's not very much surface area left for the glue to hold on. I hope the finish is fine. This is a little sketchy. Little bit sketchy, but it made it. I wasn't thinking about the reduced surface area. I got lucky. I should have put that screw in there and tightened down to at least hold down this arm because that screw is not going to give it any weird work holding forces. Yeah, this is a little too easy to get out. I guess the one end's in there pretty good. Let me get some acetone on here. I gave this one a quick deburr at the blast cabinet and we are so close. This is 95% of the way there. But I, I want to get that last 5% if we can before we go to the Kickstarter. I w and I want one that's like perfect for pictures. We're so close. I'm just going to hope this audio works. But you can see right here at the top, it's a lot thinner than it is on the same little webbing at the bottom there. So this is really thin. That there is thicker. Our lockup is looking pretty good. It's basically as good as we're going to get from a laser cut lockup. The sides here, there might be a little bit of a, a thickness difference between the left and the right side. This inside looks just a tad thinner than the outside to me, but we're close there. And same over here. The inside appears to be thinner, or the outside is thinner than the inside. And again, I'm not sure what's causing that, but I can just center that hole a little bit better. And then down at the bottom... I, let's see, I think the the bottom one, the outside is thin again, and the inside is thicker. So basically the inside is thicker all the way around, and the outside is thinner. Which implies to me that the computer thinks that the blank is wider than it is in reality. So if I go through and tell the computer the blank is this size, hopefully that'll fix it. The opening and closing action is pretty good. There's no click as it opens and closes. It's not as stiff as I would like it. So I may add some more webbing somewhere just to make it a little bit more stiff. But it does work. I am happy with the function of this. Some of the aesthetics are not quite there, but I mean, this is a working carabiner. So this is the new design running through Fusion FEA. I added an extra little webbing here and kind of moved them apart. That should lock this arm here together as a one solid piece and makes this spring effectively shorter, which should make it a much stiffer opening mechanism, back to kind of like where we originally were. Because this new one is much, much lighter to open. So this may end badly and I might break my tool, but this tool is wearing out anyway, I can tell by the burr it's leaving. I'm gonna do this with just that one screw holding down the part and no clamping force there. It should be fine. I'm a little bit worried about it pulling up here, um, but it'll be what it what it is. I'm just I'm just gonna run it and hope nothing breaks. I should probably get this all on video when it does break. That went shockingly well. So as it turns out, that Mighty Bite was completely optional and also causing all my problems. I, I did not see that coming. I learned more about fixturing today. Always learning something. Looks like I overcompensated and now the thin part is on the inside. So I'm gonna move it by half of the difference. And I just broke that end mill for a dumb reason. These are quarter inch thick titanium carabiner blanks. 
These are 200 thousandths thick titanium carabiner blanks. I had just a small handful of these quarter inch ones from that initial prototype batch, just because I wanted to test different thicknesses. I ended up not liking them and setting them aside, except for this one, which I put in the fixture, apparently. Tool came down to cut it. There was, you know, 50,000 more titanium than it had expected, and I do not have much margin in my code. Burr! Broke the tool. So I guess I need to load a new tool. On the bright side, that one was on its way out anyway. Apparently that was my last four flu eighth inch end mill, and I don't have a, a drop-in replacement for it. I have two options on hand. I have a five flu end mill, and I have a feed mill. A feed mill is an end mill that has kind of a funky geometry and is designed to cut very shallow depths of cut very quickly, which is kind of how I was running my four flutes anyway. A five flute is better for finishing walls, but it has a hard time slotting because it, it's hard to get the chips up and out of there. Though with such a shallow depth of cut, maybe that wouldn't be an issue, but this is like the perfect situation for a feed mill. The only problem is they're kind of expensive and I've never run one before. So I'm a little bit worried about breaking it. I only have two of them. I'm gonna move to these little ER16 holders for this one, both so I can get better coolant access, but also because these are higher quality than my uh, Tormach tool holders. The Tormach ones are perfectly fine and it, it, it would probably be fine, but I bought these ones used and kind of unbeknownst to me, they ended up being super high quality ones. Um, they're Technics tool holders and they have all Regofix hardware. So a Regofix collet and a Regofix nut on the top. And just the, the run out is better than what I'm getting with my Tormach tool holders. It probably won't make much of a difference, but I wanna give this feed mill every shot that I can. This also means that I get to redo all of my cam for this part, yay. The feed mill is loaded and ready to go. It's hit this weird place where it technically has like more intense speeds and feeds, but also the cycle time is twice as long. So I don't know if I'm a huge fan of this. I think the biggest factor is I'm going from a four flute to a two flute. And so like, I'm not getting as much speed, but I'm running at like twice the RPM. So I don't know. This is what feed mills are supposed to be good at. So I don't, I don't know if the, my cut is just too conservative still, even following the lake shore speeds and feeds or if like the tool just doesn't work as well for this application. I don't know, but we'll find out. While that's running, I have a package to ship. This one is almost perfect, almost. I would probably be comfortable doing product photography of this. I think I am comfortable doing product photography of this, especially when I tumble it, it'll hide the, the little bit of mismatch, but I wouldn't quite give it to a customer yet. It just needs, I need that other 5% for it to be customer ready. Um, so I've made more tweaks. I've, I've sped up my feeds and speed significantly for the feed mill. Uh, I've, I think literally doubled everything so I'm, I'm hoping this next one will be production ready code. That's my goal. Production ready part, production ready code. Took 12 tries to get this far. This is the 13th one in the machine. So fingers crossed. This speed mill is awesome. I just sandblasted it, which won't be the final finish. We'll get to, I guess, finishing tomorrow. I need to make more of these uh, for the different colors, maybe. Actually, that's a whole other conversation. We'll talk about finishes in a bit here, but it, I'm happy with it. It's done, it's good. Everything is centered, the machining looks good, the process looks good. I think it'll be reliable, though I do need to start doing it on four pockets instead of just the one pocket. But, I mean, we're there. It, it took a long time to get here but this is a titanium flexure carabiner and I am 100% happy with it. This is... Chicken. You're not supposed to be here, Mr. Rooster. Excuse me, sir.
Sir, I need you to leave now, please. Out the door. Thank you. Have a nice day. Now, wife, 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 wife. What do you think? Play with it. Click it. <laughs> so it clicks. Yeah. It clicks. Is it more blue than usual? No. Do you like it? Because it carries me into things. They, they can't see that on the video. I need a bunch of these carabiners to test finishes on and to send off to product photography and to send off to friends. So I think now for the rest of the day, I'm just gonna machine a bunch of them. It is about 10 o'clock at night now and I'm gonna go edit up tomorrow's video and go to bed. Uh, we've had some friends over, we need like a bonfire and so I haven't gotten a huge amount done. But whenever I walk by the shop, I've been starting another carabiner. So I have seven here and there's number eight, which is probably good for now. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you in the next video. What if I carabiner it to your nose? And then no, you turn okay, the we're done now.